Okay, well, good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the, the Potomac Divisional's Virtual Clinic 41. It's hard to believe this is our 41st uh, virtual clinic. We have with us uh, today uh, Kurt Thompson, uh, an MMR, former uh, superintendent of the Chesapeake Division, helping us out, and we appreciate that. With Kurt, I'll turn it over to you. All right, good afternoon, guys. Um mainly because I can only see four people at a time in my view screen here. Um, so welcome, guys. Um, clinic we're going to talk about is uh, about the Motive Power Achievement Certificate. And uh, as is the usual thing I teach or talk about whenever I talk about any of these certificates is they, they can be earned by most anybody with a little diligence and did not overthink it. So every clinic I give pretty much says, don't overthink this, just enjoy it. So, um, you know, question is why would anyone want to uh, pursue this certificate? Why would we build locomotives? Same reason we build anything else, you know, structures or cars, they're part of the model railroad. And a lot of times from the articles that I've read and stuff, it's most often that the need for a particular locomotive for the modeler is driving the driving the uh, the build. And, you know, need slash want are interchangeable as we are model railroads, of course. So, of course, let's go to the let's go to the requirements first and let's talk about them because. If we don't talk about them, the rest of this will make no sense as to why I'm doing things. Uh, the AP certificate, you know, it says you have to build three scale models of railroad motive power, one of which must meet the qualifications for scratch built. And motive power is defined as a locomotive or other self-propelled vehicle. The scratch built requirement has different meanings depending on what type of vehicle, you know, what type of locomotive you're building. A steam locomotive to be scratch built has to have a scratch built frame, boiler, cab, tender frame and body, valve gears, or side rods. The rest of the motive power has to have a scratch built body, frame, cab, power truck side frames, Pantograph or trolley pulls as necessary as appropriate. The models must be capable of self propulsion on the same gauge of track as the model. In other words, you can't build no scale model and you know tuck HO wheels under it and call it a you know it might be a narrow gauge O scale, but there it is. And all three of the models must be super detailed. And again, there's now for the exceptions or the exemptions. Um, things that don't count for you, well, don't count against you if they are not um, scratch built. Motors, gears, drivers and wheels, not the side rods, but the drivers and wheels. Couplers, light bulbs, elect other electronics, uh, the trucks, not the side frames, paint decals, such things as bells, marker lights, and uh, brake fittings. And of course, the ever popular, what we start with, the basic shapes of wood, plastic, or other metal or other things. Uh, hell else, you know, that's, that's about the fabrication. And each of them must earn a merit award you know, 87 and a half out of 125. And that's through an MRA sponsored contest or merit award evaluation. And then you do the paperwork. And then you submit it. And then the paperwork comes to your division AP guy who in Potomac is Martin. In Chesapeake, it's me. Uh, off the top of my head, so I've got the list somewhere, but I can't run the run the table on the other divisions. Although I hopefully you individually know who your AP guy is in your, in your division. For me, um, 
I'm pursuing this by building two switchers and a box cab. Um, I, I am, I took steam engines right off the table because one, I'm not going to, uh, I was in no way was, do I have a machine shop in my basement? I'm a model railroad or not a model machinist. And, um, you know, the other thing too, is I'm very simply, I'm a diesel era modeler. Granted, my, the diesels I'm looking at are, you know, 1930s, you know, when they were introduced. So um, when I first thought about this, when I, I thought this would be one of the seven certificates I'd get to become a master model railroader, I was looking at doing trolleys. Um, but then again, I didn't want to, I had started looking at how pantographs are built. And I'm like, again, seen more more effort than is worth and you know as the under title of this says don't overthink this well i overthought it enough that it kept me from pursuing the certificate until about three years ago when i suddenly quit overthinking it and just read the instructions also i it was after i got my mmr so okay now i can breathe i don't have to hold my breath on this one Um, moving to O scale has kind of changed, um, uh, my thoughts on what I was going to do. You know, I like switching as it says, I'm unapologetic. If it comes to operation, I want to either be on a local freight doing switching or in a yard. Um, as some have seen, I did have, a, I do have an O scale layout. I'm in the middle of a reconstruction of it now in a room that most would consider too small for HO, but uh, it was a switching layout. And uh, again, like many, I have a, a, a growing fascination with rail, with uh, car float operations. Um, at one point I was considering doing Erie's 28th Street Yard in Brooklyn, uh, New York, and that really would have fit my almost in scale my space in O scale if I had pursued it. But uh, the Cincinnati and Lake Erie being in Ohio and the Miami River and the Ohio River were not large car float operation opportunities. So that's uh, kind of where it went for a while. Uh, the first thing I, I liked was um, the box cab. And uh, you know, it says that you've got to do the frame. So the first thing I did was Atlas came out with in the 70s, or actually Roco from Australia, or Austria, gave uh, Atlas a whole bunch of O-scale cheap things, and you can still find them on eBay. Uh, an F9, wide vision cabooses, boxcars, gondola. So the picture on the left shows um, the dissection of, a, of an atlas frame. Uh, and so but we all know an F9 is longer than an Alco box cab. Um, and for me, it ended up the distance requirement was uh, exactly the length of the motor. So I <laughs> hacked the frame just outside of the motor and threw away the fuel tank. And then I got out my magnetic uh, assembly tray and pushed everything together, lined it all up, and then reinforced the two halves, the now two halves, what used to be two thirds, into, um, into a frame. That's, of course, square styrene. I think it's one eighth inch square styrene uh, splicing plate. The uh, picture on the left is the completed frame with the trucks reinstalled. And uh, yeah, that's that's a uh, load of uh, BBs or uh, lead shot actually filled in the cavity and uh, more than uh, probably two ounces of Elmer's glue because the motor in those Roco 
F9s uh, is not a can motor, but it's about this big, and it weigh it's all the weight you need in that locomotive. It's centered in the motor. So these things, the modified frame, I had to find ways to put weight in it. The other part of that is um, the wheelbase on the trucks. If you look at the right-hand picture, those are standard EMD Blomberg trucks with a nine-foot wheelbase. The um, Alco side frames, you know, wheel sets are... Uh, have a seven foot wheel base and that comes into play in a minute for those of you who were at altoona uh, saw the tinker cad clinic i gave um, before some of the other things i did is i took the uh, blueprints that were in model railroaders locomotive cyclopedia the big red flat book and they have O scale plans for the uh, the box cab because of the um, not being able to shorten the frame because of the wheels I ended up having to redraw the um, box cab side side panels because as I told you there was an extra two feet of uh, truck space under you know length so I had to stretch the uh, the box cab side frame, uh, not side frame, the box cab sides, four feet. So I kind of had to slip a little room in. And where that extra room comes in is the panels here and here and here are actually where the four feet are hidden. Um, if you laid the plans in mind, Side by side, you can see where they fall out. Uh, this is, of course, one of the end panels. And then to, I made two shortened versions to fit inside so that I can have that. The roof is going to be 10,000 styrene, of course, laid across the top. So I needed some internal bracing for that roof as well. So when I get these printed, probably from Shapeways, it'll be two of everything in the picture. So, and if you remember, I said that I had to stretch the truck. The side frame has to be stretched. So after the, you know, the nice thing about O scale is if the print's the right thing, I can just copy it and then use my digital calipers and measure it and then go right into uh, Tinkercad and, and make it. And the sketch for this, that's going to be the side frame. And just like building it in styrene, you know, build it from the bottom layer out. So these parts I've actually, it's all in Tinkercad, all the various pieces have been joined into one piece. But there were Trying to think, probably I had to design. I think this probably had the order of 60 individual pieces, squares and stuff. Tinkercad's very nice. It, in it, it does have rivets or little hexagons that you can use for rivet heads. And so that's where that comes from. Now, the side frame being because I drew it in Tinkercad and will print it, that will count for being scratch built. Um, I don't have to, I thought about building it in Styrene and then casting a master, which would also count for scratch built. Um, if somebody else does this and borrows my thing, they won't get count, they won't get credit for scratch building the side frame because they didn't draw it. But if you've been through the Tinkercad clinic, you know, it's just trial and error and learning a new skill. The other two locomotives that I'm going to do are the Bush Terminal Ingersoll ran 300 horsepower switchers. Um, 
And for these, I'm gone completely from not even, um, you know, taking something pre-existing and tearing it apart like I did with the Atlas F unit. This is actually, this frame is going to be built from styrene, or is built, actually. Um, the top, well, what the bottom sheet is 60,000 styrene. And then the braces are, uh, you know, single beams on their side. Actually, they're um, I beams. And these are positioned according to a diagram that I got from uh, Railway, Railway Age Gazette, which is available online if you type it in. It's all in open free domain. And there's an article from December 7th, 1931. Uh, it was, if you ever read the Gazette, the uh, Railway Age Gazette, it's basically part information and part um, commercial. And it's almost whoever built something, if you want to sell it more, you write up an article and say, I sold it to so and so, and now you can use it. Um, but in that article, they had the underframe of the locomotive flip. That they, they had a picture of it inverted, and so it gave a very good detail of what these beams looked like and where they were spaced. Um, you see, in the top half of that, those trucks are actually um, part of the motor. Each axle has its own motor. So these truly are traction motors and traction and uh, in the truck. And they will be wired in series, um, all four, because <laughs> the uh, the DC, the motors that the lowest geared locomotive, lowest wound motors that I could get that would fit inside the O-scale trucks still are high speed as into at 12 volts they're going to run about between 8 and 12,000 rpms so wiring them in series i'm trying to cut that down by a fourth and even more um and since this will have dcc i will crush them crush the speed table in dcc with them as well so that uh i get switch your speed not uh not rdc rubber band power speed out of them. Now the motor, as I said, the motors are traction motors fit into the drawing. And this is actually the first thing I did in Tinkercad was to build um, two of these. Uh, this is the top portion of the uh, motor mount. And these side panels are where the side trucks will mount along with the uh, wipers, the brass wipers for the motors, for the pickups. And this is the centering hole for uh, mounting it to the through the frame. And its mate is similar. Uh, it has a hole too so that I can reach a screwdriver through it to mount the uh, truck because the two clam, the two shells halves come together and are screwed together with uh, 0040 screws, very small. Likewise, here is the completed side frame for the Ingersoll Rand switcher. Again, this is if uh, you were in the clinic, I'll go through the Tinkercad clinic uses this side frame as the, uh, the walkthrough piece. Um, I've since gone back through and have updated the pictures because when I first did it, these springs were this tile, which is incorrect. Of course, they should be helical coil springs. And uh, somebody in Tinker in the Tinkercad community said, hey, I need springs. And it, since it's open source, they provided new and better springs. So the latest version of this actually has helical coil springs here. The reason I chose to do the Ingersoll Rand ones because is mainly because of this side frame. 
And the article in Rail Age, Railway Age Gazette explains what it is. The side frame is built out of a 26 inch tall I beam. And what they did is they cut the openings for the journals, the, the spring plates for the uh, equalization. And that's how they bid it, did it. It literally is the most simplistic side frame a diesel could ever have. And it doesn't have to have a lot of equalization or anything because these things delivered at a top speed of 25 miles an hour. So, you know, again, if you want to build one of the self-steering EMD, um, HTC side frames that go under an, an SD90 Mac, you know, now they've been discontinued, have at it. Um, that's far too detailed for me. <laughs> Choose your targets carefully, gentlemen. That's all I'll say about that. And here you can see these are the 3D printed versions. Um, the bottom frame with the large hole for the screwdriver to go through. The top plate. And these two fit into each other and lock in. And then two of the side frames, which would be attached to a spacer along with the wipers on these side panels, the drop panels. So in for a penny, in for a pound, I'm going to be having the long hood. Uh, this is the end of um, the Ingersoll Rand long hood for the locomotive, again, done in Tinkercat. Um, so this will get printed. Here's the, the, the cab unit. And this is not a true center cab. It is... It is a centered cab, but it has a longer hood and a shorter hood. Uh, and the long hood was only a little bit more difficult than the short hood to do. But um, so with all things those being scratch built, I mean, being 3D printed and drawn in Tinkercad by me are, you know, meets the requirements. Now, when you do read the instructions, if anything that is exempt from scratch building, if you don't want to scratch build it, don't. But if you do anything from the scratch building list, you know, the exemption list, you gain points in the in the evaluation. So when I get the term the Bush terminal engines done, because I've made the motor mounts and designed and got traction motor sets and had the wheel, wheels drilled out and I mounted them on axles. All of those things will gain me extra points uh, towards, towards scratch building. Um, you know, honesty being the policy here, I am in the process of these. I have this, these projects are running concurrently with about nine other things I'm doing. So uh, I had hoped to get them done so that I could have got them judged at Altoona, but uh, that didn't happen. So maybe when we get to Durham, I will have them done. If not, I'll get them done at New Jersey the year after that. So, but if you look at the requirements and you look what I'm going to be doing, um, hopefully you see it's not arduous and it isn't difficult to match the scratch building requirements and to meet them so um that's pretty much all i've got i've uh walking through this with you and show you my thinking and where i'm at uh the frames and the truck assemblies are all done uh, the side frames for the ingersoll rands have been printed they're finished the ones for the Alco box cab haven't been printed yet. Um, I had hoped to get uh, copies of the side, the box cab components printed, but uh, a friend of mine who was using his 
uh, the 3D printer at his work in their maker space ran into printing printer problems. So I wasn't able to show you those those outside of the uh, site vaporware of Tinkercad. As always, guys, you know, I'm also the AP region guy. I'm here to help you and your AP division guy for you to reach your goals. If getting the AP motive power one is one of your goals, um, we have a lot of modelers, you know, MMRs who've received theirs already. So there's a lot of resources out there in person. And I stand ready to be one of those. So at this point, Ernie, I'm done running my mouth. If anyone's got questions or comments, we can go for a little Q&A or discussion time. Thanks for letting me uh, present this. Hey, Kurt, this is Jack. Yes, Jack. Aside from the obvious uh, one scratch-built locomotive, uh, what's the challenge of, or I'm thinking about... Uh, kits locomotive kits super detailing yeah <laughs> i mean yeah putting putting a modern atlas uh jeep nine in with all the attached stuff that they give you really won't get probably won't get you to the 87 and a half so it it means the super detailing for something bought you know, an old Atlas or, you know, I mean, I mean if you take an Atlas blue, blue box locomotive and super detail it, I've seen people earn merit awards with those. Yeah. Well, I can see where if you painted one, there's some, you could get points there. Right. And it's probably easier to super detail a steam kit than a diesel kit. Probably. Because you're, yeah, I mean, a lot of these steam um, locos that I've seen from guys, uh, they're adding ropes and chains and tools and all kinds of stuff. Yeah, and and reworking the pipes, you know, mm. for the various appliances and stuff because it may not match the, it may not, it may not match the prototype that they want, and mm. uh, you know. <laughs> Alan Mendy is comes to mind. I know Alan's done. He's taken stock Bachman 460 and and reworked it for a Central New Jersey prototype. And he he took it down to uh, a bare bare boiler almost. Well, I don't know of anybody who's at Alan's level. <laughs> I went to his class. I'm, I'm only offering him the as the example <laughs> of reworking the pipes and the appliances. Yeah. But yeah, okay. now. Adding a Dakota, um, uh, would that give you a few what details? A Dakota doesn't. I mean, uh, it won't give you details unless you're using it to control the lights in a more prototypical fashion. Okay. Um, right. uh, you know, if if you're going to go to the yeah. Einstein route and scratch build your scratch build your own or make your own lights then yeah by all means but that that's a bit much for the the return on just, to just adding on getting is not going to do much all right yeah <clears throat> yeah scratch building your own headlight is you know the, the light element itself isn't going to gain me two points it's going to be not worth my time and effort <laughs> on the ingersoll rand that you um illustrated you cut up um the frame no that that was for the uh alco the box, box cap. cap. Yeah, yeah. Okay. The box cap. So does that then turn what might have been a scratch build into a kit bash? It does. I'm not going to I'm going to submit the two Ingersoll Rands as scratch built. Uh -huh. Okay. Um yeah, I didn't want uh, the reason is I was reusing I I'll answer the lot the logic behind why I did it that way. The motor, the trucks, I didn't want to fabricate another entire set of trucks and mountings mm -hmm. like I did for the Ingersoll Rand. Right. Now I could, I've done it. I've, I've done all the preliminary work in Tinkercad. I could do it. 
but the Atlas trucks were properly geared already. And I was, didn't want to reinvent, literally did not want to reinvent the wheel, the truck, the mounting for all those. So instead of making seven foot, six inch long wheelbase trucks and scratch building, you know, new motor mounts and, you know, side frames, I did kind of kit bash that. But, you know, if one of the two Ingersoll Rands passes as a scratch built and they both would be identical, then the Alco box cab would be kit built and would still qualify with all the detail. Hey, so, Kurt, Greg Cassidy, I was wondering the same yeah, thing Greg. Jack brought up. Uh, it, it, is there any kind of point where there's a crossover between kit bash and scratch built? Um, if you uh, it, if you took part of something that's railroad related and took it apart and reused it in a totally different area, would it be considered scratch built? Can you flesh out your your example, yes, Greg, um, so I, I can follow it? Yeah, I just built a uh, a little scratch built structure, and for the flashing where the stovepipe came out, I took a wheel off of a, a wheel set, the plastic wheel, shaved it down and used it because it was already round. So I would say, that I don't see that as, did you, when you look at kit built versus scratch built, look, you have to look at the overall function, the overall quality of the thing. There's a 90% rule. Right. So if, and, and you repurposed the wheel and you modified the wheel, you yes. didn't just, it's, and and I'm sorry, there's not a lot of buildings I know that have wheels. They're called they they are, but they're called trailers. No, it's just um, it's a round piece of flashing that the stovepipe comes out. So I figured, you know, Greg, I I would <laughs> still I don't think you violated your your qual your qualification of scratch built on that building, Jack. Do you think? Uh, I'm 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 listening to Greg. I'm saying, why don't you just cut a circle in styrene? Because I can and never cut a circle round. <laughs> And this thing Thank was you. already round. I just had to shave it down a little bit, and it was right there. <laughs> Greg is Greg is my hero because he's he's admitted that he can't cut a circle. <laughs> now, I'm but, in the, I'm in could, that boat. <laughs> but you could probably three D design one, <laughs> and and that was my second question. I thought that to be scratch built with three D, you had to either do the printing or someone else couldn't intervene no the rules okay. on 3d the rule yeah the rules on 3d printing are you have to just like if you made if you make the master mm -hmm. and you cast it or have someone else cast it for you you make the master that piece is scratch built you do it in Tinkercad or Fusion 360 or whatever CAD drawing you want. You do it. You can send it to Shipways and they will print it. Uh -huh. They're not going to worry about it. You know, they're not, you know. Now, the thing is, ultimately, if I, after I've done doing the Tinkercad or after the Ingersoll Rands are built, I can put those three, the short cab, the long cab, and the hood or the two long and short hoods in the cab up on Shapeway's site. Yeah, to be sold. To be to be used, you know, yeah. $5 a piece or whatever. Yeah. I don't even know what what people are getting for it. But anybody who uses them cannot earn scratch build points for them because, but they can still do kit building and super detail work mm -hmm. and make them qualify for the 87 and a half. I guess I was under the interpretation if somebody else intervened yeah. in the process. No. Okay, great. The, it's good to well, hear. you know, kind of the whole thing again is, okay, um, how is Shapeways different than using uh, and, and comparing apples and oranges? We're talking locomotives and track work here. A fast tracks jig. Mm -hmm. 
Well, they call a fast track jig a tool. So you're calling Shapeways a tool? Yes. A 3D yes. print a 3D printer is a tool. So, but, it's not, but as Greg is, I think there's no there's no brains in a 3D printer. There is <laughs> brains in trying to put a CAD drawing together. Yeah, I think <laughs> where I had heard it utilized was if you sent your design to let Shapeways or a friend of yours who has a 3D printer or something, when they put it in their slicer, if they have to manipulate it to print, then no, they've that, touched it, so it's not scratch no. or something. Okay. The na the national the, the national the ruling from on high, you know, basically from Frank Cook and the others on the national achievement program have studied this and have come. The answer is your 3D print, your 3D diagram goes and is printed and is not. Now, if they have to, and this is where Shapeways is good. If Shapeway has an issue with it, they'll send you a note back going, we can't do this as it's drawn. You need to correct something. Uh -huh. That's not intervention because they didn't they didn't correct the drawing the error. Oh, I see. So if if it gets manipulated to print, they'll they'll advise you that you need okay. to do the manipulation. Right, so and they will do your design. Okay. Yeah. Great. So yeah, because the motor trucks, you know, the the two clamshells, the top and bottom, mm -hmm. were printed by uh, a friend of mine. Another friend printed the uh, the side frames. But they did nothing to my prints. Okay. I mean, yeah, they sent you know they sent me, and I learned that it is a reiterative process, especially with the uh, top and bottom motor mounts. They went through five iterations from my initial, "Hey Jeff, print these for me," and I get them back, and they're like, "They don't work." <laughs> hey Jeff, print this one for me. Yeah, and me and my model railroading ego. Thought, hey, I got these right the first time. This this is a one and done. Now they were one and five done, <laughs> not one and done, five done. Gents, my dog is barking, so uh, thank you, Kirk. I have to uh, I have to scoot. All right, Jack. Okay, uh, thank you, Kirk. Good before day. before I let you go, could you just do a brief recap? Three pieces of motive power for the AP. One scratch built. One eighty-seven and a half, and one along for the ride. Um, yeah, and maybe I'm no. oversimplifying. Go through the requirements again for AP motive power. Actually, I'm gonna I'm gonna turn. Alex is over here wait, waiting patiently, but I'll let Alex do it because he's he's got his AP motive power. Oh, all right. <clears throat> I'll let him recon. I'll let him reconfirm, but I'm I'm gonna double check. Yeah, all, all three of them have to be merit. Awards. Award winners. Okay. Three merit awards. One scratch built. One scratch one. built. The other two. All, su all super detailed. Yeah. Super uh, detailed. En enough to get 87 and a half. Correct. And then one 87 and a half scratch built. Okay. Yeah. Now, um, See, 87 and a half. Let's take a steam locomotive example uh, where you're going to. Beyond my limits, although I do have a lathe, I do have a milling machine, but I ain't that good. Uh, but I can do some CAD. Can I reuse a frame, uh, motor mount, and let's just say running gear from a steam locomotive, detail the heck out of it, make it act, resemble my prototype right down to the rivets? Is that... 87 and a half possible if it's I reuse a frame and running gear. It is, but I don't think you're going to meet this. You won't meet the scratch built requirement because you're I not scratch building. Okay. And that's fine. That I'm, just, I'm just looking for the 87 and a half because it's, I would bet you could, you know, the magic number is 88, right? Okay. Number, yeah, of, keyboard, yeah, yeah. number of keys on a piano. That's all we're counting. Sure. Through. Yeah. And this particular locomotive happens to be my all time favorite. And uh, but the frame and running gear is just over the edge for me. But okay. I think I can put I enough think, detail and enough rivets to get 87 and a half off it. 
I bet you could. I don't see that a lot of people do it that way. Now, scratch built, uh, I'm going to take a different approach, and I'm basically trying to muddle my way through uh, AutoCAD 360. I'm giving up on that rapidly, and I'm going to go with <laughs> non shape, uh, and I'm going to build a uh, gas electric from okay. completely from scratch, and that'll be all uh my own CAD work once I get the CAD work is I have the advantage of actually having the prototype within about 30 miles of me and I have some original drawings etc cetera, etc cetera. so that gas electric is going to be my pride and joy I always wanted to build and that will be scratch built and I've already got a start from a previous convention on a super detailed diesel that I should be able to up the level on. And maybe I think I got maybe 70 points on it the last time. Maybe I can tweak enough to get it up to 88 magic number. And, okay. and that sounds like a plan for me for AP. And, and Jim, you touched on something that is important. If you get something evaluated and it does not meet the merit award level, mm -hmm. if your judges, if the evaluators, I have to look. I have. I've been told by Gordy, our our president, it's like I've got to lose the word judges. If the evaluators, oh, did did not give. Oh, it, there's a whole thing now. These are not judge unless it's a contest. Contests are judged because you you rank first, second, third. Oh. But models themselves are evaluated. I'll have to tell that to Jack. Sorry, he left already, but he has evaluated. A number of my models for okay. me. So well, the, but the point you bring up is if your evaluators did not give you feedback about how you could improve the model. Oh, they did. They, they did. Okay. It was very, very then, detailed. Then, and it's like, okay, that's the uh, KITA. And uh, yes, I if I were to follow my evaluators' advice and get off my buttocks, I could probably get up to 88. Okay. And then, and that's, but the point being is if you get something evaluated once and it does not meet the merit award level, you can rework it and resubmit it to be evaluated Absolutely. again. This, yeah. this, the, you know, they, they, they talk about this is the, the achievement program is the world of do over. Absolutely. You know, take a mulligan, you know, take the mulligan. Yeah. Just move and, on, and, and you know, pick it up, play the net, play it where it lies, and move on. You know, on, on to the next one. Anyway, yeah, yeah, yeah I mean, that's good advice. I didn't. I when I will admit when I did my structures, I got fed up, and and I uh, some that were not going to ever make. I, it didn't matter how how much benefit I was given and how much the evaluators gave me. Well, you could do this and make it better. There were some that I just dropped the bomb on. I literally. Yeah, they were right now. Had, those, those are the ones on the back of the layout. Uh, no, you know, this was this, in, this ended up being a pile of uh, unusable strip strip wood when I got done Ooh. with it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> you know, God, Godzilla and the Tokyo wooden homes. You know what I mean? Uh, I know what you mean. I know what you mean. Yeah, Kurt Zilla. I, I destroyed a few Kurt Zilla. I'm, I'm just trying to just trying to crank up. Uh, three skills that are lacking one is resistant soldering uh which usually involves in a lot of other parts falling off but <laughs> i can improve the bat the brass loco uh with that rework the boiler cab tender etc cetera, etc cetera, all the good things that need to to get it up to 88 uh the 3d cad i've got to march on i have made some parts uh, nothing as ambitious as this gas electric, but that's on the learning curve. Uh, you don't, you don't learn 3d CAD in a day. A no, month, a year. I and, with think with Tinkercad, Jim, I started probably four years ago. Hmm. So you're making rapid progress like I am. Oh, no, no, no. The, the story is sillier than that. And I went through and did all their tutorials. Couldn't figure out what I was doing. It went on the back burner for two years. Uh -huh. I, I literally, I went to log back in and I was surprised I still had an active login to Tinkercad because <laughs> it, it's a web-based thing. Yeah, it is. Yeah. 
And, you know, and subsequently I've written uh, a three-part article for O-Scale Trains magazine about using Tinkercat. I've now done the clinic a couple, you know. I've yeah, got, I read that article. Good. Yeah. So. Inspirational. It wasn't. Yeah. Well, hey, you know, I, I believe in the, the old Geico commercial. You know, it's so easy. Even a Neanderthal can do it. Well. Pretty much. You know, yep. Yep. I, yep. So I, you put I, down your stone club and picked up a stylus. Okay. Yes. Pretty much. No, I wouldn't even. I probably wouldn't even have been a good stonemason because I can't see what what's what's hidden inside the piece of wood. That's why you take away everything that isn't the Mona Lisa. Yeah, I know. Yeah, it, yeah, everything that isn't it, that isn't you know the statue of man. <laughs> no, I can't see how the statue of man fits in that that you know the one by four by nine monolith. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, so. I sympathize. Okay. But anyway, that's it. Okay. That's what I want to ask. And all I can say is I'm going to, you know, pick up my mouse or uh, pick up my soldering iron and or uh, pick up some of the debris off the floor because I can, I can still find that locomotive in the back stall of my roundhouse. That's how much it's seen, but I'm going to, I can upgrade that too. So, Okay. Uh, thanks very much. This uh, seminar has been quite helpful. And like I say, every once in a while, we need a little prodding to you know, get off our doofus and get back at it. Well, if you have a, a lathe or something, Jim, I may be sending you something in the, in the uh, next year to, uh, mm -hmm. to uh, drill out some, because I'm going to need to change these. The Ingersoll Rand are being built to, uh, the five foot gauge O scale. I've now gone okay. to P4. I've now gone to P48, so I need to do redo the motors. Uh, well, you so, see, you're inspirational because uh, I actually worked for Ingersoll Rand for 18 years, different wow. division, but yeah. it was, uh, yeah, I actually uh, was able to go back to headquarters one visit and uh, I got some plans, and you know, so I got in inspired to. You know, once in a while, I'm going to take my old uh, model die casting and then turn those into to real Ingersoll Rands. But, you know, one of those uh, back burner projects. Let's say. I was going to say, if, if you happen to stumble on the Bush Terminal 300 plans, let me know. <laughs> Keep my eyes open there. <laughs> now, fortunately, I've since retired, so most of my contacts have, uh, have gone by the way. But it's yeah. the thought that counts. Keep my eyes open. Well, John Techmuller had somebody in the Rail Marine Special Interest Group did a side elevation, and that's what I drew from, drew all the Tinkercad stuff from. Ah, good. And they happened to be in O scale. You know, when they came over, I measured them. They were not quite in O scale. I had to inflate them about a hundred, about thirteen percent. They were oh, okay. under, you know. But once I got them on O scale, then I took my digital calipers and measured off and. Awesome. Went to town. Yeah. Now, so most of the most of the lathe work, oddly enough, that I've done has been for other guys in uh, CPD thirteen. It seems you know the the word once once you got something that works, the word gets out. Hey, Murph, can you do this? I'll fill in the blank. <laughs> well, fun. my mine will be simple, Jim. Well, I'll ask you. I'll send you the motors and the wheels, and ask you to to. Take the Northwest short line oh, wheels, put the axles I, I in them. I also noticed that I think Rob Russo was in the background. I'm smiling, laughing, funny faces. Uh, I also do uh, uh, old fashioned yeah. resin castings, and, and mm -hmm. Rob is uh, smiling in the back. Oh, wait a minute. He's gone beyond. Look, yeah. at, look at Rob's there. <laughs> there I was going to say, Rob's got a bag in his hand. <laughs> he's got a bag of castings that are made from a. Uh, uh, a model fuel tank, the old, uh, um, oh, I can't remember what it was. He used to jettison fuel tanks. Yeah. So we, we have turned those into fuel tanks that will be going on his flat car load when oh. he gets off his buttocks and starts building the flat car and the frame to install all those. Uh, he's, oh, he's turning. He's going back to the bench. And yeah, so here's two. Look okay. at those, will you? 
Mm-hmm. Just gotta glue them together and assemble them into the load. There you go. So, uh, well, that's what uh, CPD did. We don't get much work done on our own, but we're able to do quite a bit of work for other guys in the division. <laughs> we keep them moving along. Yeah. Well, I'll be happy to see you all live again in person in nine months. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, we don't. What do we, what do we have, Rob? Uh, what? 19, 29 months till the convention. Oh, yeah, we'll be ready. <laughs> it's shorter than that. Uh, I'm that's what I'm I, afraid of. And I wonder say, why uh, nothing's getting done now because we're <laughs> all trying to get ready for the convention. Oh. Uh, be, being the, the antagonistic realist a little bit, nine months, seven days. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah. I was always suspicious of you, man. <laughs> <laughs> What am I going to do with you, Kurt? <laughs>